Oh God, that is the question on our minds and hearts. When shall we see Jesus? You know the answer. We want to be ready. Let this teaching be clear. We pray in his name. Amen. You've been tracking the news this last week. Did you hear about that uh, spacecraft? They landed on an asteroid. Did you hear about that? Amazing feat of technology. There's an asteroid uh, 200 million miles away, and it's called Bennu. They say it's about as tall as the Empire State Building. And NASA landed a spacecraft on the spinning asteroid. Robotic arm grabs a handful of rock, and it's coming back to Earth. It will arrive September 24, 2023, somewhere in a Utah desert. Can you believe that? But let's just say, for the sake of illustration, that there's another asteroid out there. Well, actually, there's a whole bunch of other asteroids unidentified. NASA thinks there are probably about 2 million asteroids out there, 30 meters or larger. Okay, so th those are fairly big, of which only 18,000 have been identified and tracked. So let's say one slams into Earth. Nobody knew it was coming. I got an email from a geologist friend of mine living out on the West Coast. I'm going to read it to you. Hey, Dwight, we haven't talked in a while, but your sermon this morning, all caps, woke me up. A few weeks ago, some of you remember we had a, we had a presentation on asteroids. You remember that? And we're looking at Luke 21. Jesus says, hey, the powers of heaven are going to be shaken just before I come back, and asteroids are hugely in the news right now. So she's, she's thinking out loud. So hugely woke me up, she says. So an asteroid... Asteroids, she suggests, hit San Francisco or L.A. Millions die, but why would other countries tremble in fear? Now, Jesus said the whole planet will be seized with terror because of the heavens being shaken. But if it's, not, if, if, if it's in San Francisco, who cares around the world? But the geologist answers her own question. Because if the asteroid triggers a Richter scale 10 on the San Andreas Fault... I have been told the earth will ring like a bell. I think the chains of fault systems around the world would be activated. The destruction of all the major cities and some nuclear plants sitting on the faults will get everyone's attention. The ground will tremble worldwide. The tsunamis, Jesus talks about that as well in Luke 21, will make our oceans roar. Add to all of this the activation of the volcanic chaos. And yes, globally, people will tremble in fear with one asteroid. Wow. Could it happen? And if it did, what would happen on this planet? Fascinating. A social scientist named Michael Barkham from the University of New York in Buffalo researched the effect of disasters on people's attitudes, publishes research under the title Disasters and the Millennium. Marvin Moore, my friend, reports on the findings in his own book, Could It Really Happen? So let me put uh, Michael Barkham on the, uh, on the screen for us right now. One of his most significant conclusions was that, quote, quoting Barkham, Disaster creates conditions peculiarly fitted to the rapid alteration of belief systems. Given what we are about to discover in the apocalypse, it is really important that you pay attention to this research right now. I'll read two more lines from him. Michael Barkin on the screen. Line number two, disaster produces the questioning, the anxiety, and the suggestibility that are required for belief system change. Keep reading. Only in its wake, in disaster's wake, are people moved to abandon old values of the past. Guess what? When we're faced with a disaster, individually, collectively, or nationally, the deep shaking that that disaster brings to our psyches cuts loose values that we thought were deeply rooted. Hmm. Let me put, let me put one, one more up. Michael Barkham. A disaster population suffers a temporary sense of incapacity, vulnerability, and confusion. 
The collapsed social structure renders traditional authority relationships less effective and traditional statuses less meaningful. Now, here comes the big line. Belief systems which under non-disaster conditions might be dismissed. Nah, I don't believe that. Now receive sympathetic consideration, end quote. Now, listen, this doesn't even have to be an asteroid. We're talking disaster. It could be a killer quake. It could be an economic collapse. It could be a government coup. It could be a civil war. It doesn't matter which, what you want to call it. If it's a disaster, something happens to the human psyche in trying to cope with survival. We're going to look at a scenario right now that with a disaster could happen overnight. Open your Bible with me to Revelation chapter 13. Let's go. We have been to this chapter before, but not in this detail. Come on. Revelation chapter 13, the Bible's last book, American Apocalypse. Is the religious right wrong? Let's go. Revelation chapter 13. Let's pick it up in verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming up out of the earth. Hit the pause button right there. The moment we read second beast, we know something about this chapter, and that is there's a first beast to Revelation 13. Yep, there is. It comes out of the sea, bri dripping brine, seven heads with blasphemy all over the heads. Yeah, the beast has already been introduced. And John the Revelator says, oh, by the way, I need to tell you about beast number two, but let's go back to beast number one. I want you to go up in the chapter to verse 3. Speaking of the, the sea beast with the seven heads, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. Verse 14, people worshiped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Whoa, 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 stop, stop. So this, this first beast, seven heads, obviously it's a religious power because the heads all have blasphemy. And what is blasphemy but usurping God's power for diabolical re uh, reasons? And it receives worship. An atheistic institution will never receive worship. It says, what, what are you, crazy? It's a religious power. It has to be. Hmm. And clearly... This beast rules with global clout. It is a global superpower. Hmm. Daniel 7, Revelation chapter 13. The great Protestant reformers, as they studied those two apocalyptic chapters, were led to the conclusion that they must identify this sea beast as the antichrist power that ruthlessly ruled dur during the dark and bloody Middle Ages from Rome. The sea beast. But it was wounded. In fact, in, 1970, in 17, rather, 1798, speaking of the French Revolution, Napoleon sends in his general Berthier. And he takes the Pope captive, Pope Pius VI. The Vatican is shut down, wounded. Now, that's just transpired. Verse 10 describes it being taken into captivity. Then on the heels of that, we read these words. What did we just read? A second beast coming up out of the earth. Whoa, what's this second beast coming up out of the earth? Well, the first beast came out of the water. Water, Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. The water is a symbol of people, nations, kindreds, languages, the first beast comes up out of the th peopled thoroughfares of Europe. But the, but the second beast comes not out of water. It comes out of earth, dry earth, barren wilderness, a place called the New World. That beast was wounded in 1798. Coincidentally, this beast arises to power in the late 1700s, same time. And the Greek word for springing up describes a weed. It grows fast. A global, and it becomes a global superpower, as we are immediately going to notice. Global superpower, late 1700s, barren wilderness of the new world. Guess what? There's only one nation on this planet that could fit this description. And you know who it is. It's the United States of America. Read the verse again. 
And then I saw a second beast coming up out of the earth. And it had two horns. Oh, I love this. It had two horns like a lamb. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little fuzzy curly hair. And, a, and lambs have these little tiny horns, you know, just little protrusions here. Two horns. It's youthful. It's a symbol of youthfulness. It's a symbol of, uh, of innocence. Perhaps it's a symbol of the two great liberties that this land has always championed, civil liberty and religious liberty. Maybe that's what this is all about. It has two horns. What a fitting description. In the latest issue of Liberty Magazine, there's a piece by Ron Capshaw all about Roger Williams. Do you remember Roger Williams, the Baptist minister who founded a colony, Rhode Island, in the early 1600s? you remember him? This is an article about him, and I want to put uh, Capshaw's words on the screen here. Roger Williams established the first area, or we'd call it colony, to practice the separation of church and state in the New World. He codified the idea that the government could rule only in civil matters. As such, the Providence, that's Providence, Rhode Island, the Providence government could not punish those who violated, and these, these are uh, Roger Williams' words, the religious principles contained in the Ten Commandments, such as idolatry, Sabbath breaking, false worship, and blasphemy. Williams goes on, the laws of the first table of the Ten Commandments are not regulations for civil society or a political order. They belong to the realm of religion, not politics, not politics. Hmm. And so for, for two and a half centuries in this great nation, America has championed the separation of church and state, and rightfully so. Roger Williams was the one who taught us to favor neither religion over government nor government over religion. You got to keep them separate. Keep them separate. Don't pull them together. That's been the genius of this land. But something dreadful happens. This global superpower begins to speak like a dragon. Enter Earth Beast Phase 2. Revelation 13, 11 again. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon, Satan. Verse 12, and it exercised. The, the, the Greek present, uh, historical present is used, actually, so these are all in the present tense in the Greek. It exercises all the authority of the first beast, that would be Rome, on its behalf, and made, makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound has been healed. Wow. How could that humanly, how could that conceivably even be possible in a freedom-loving church and state separating land like America? Indeed, it is incomprehensible unless or until you introduce an unexpected, debilitating cataclysm that strikes this nation. And suddenly all bets are off. Something obviously has gone terribly wrong. We don't know what it is. But it's gone terribly wrong to the place that not only the citizens, did you notice that? Not only the citizens of the United States, but the inhabitants of the entire planet are so shaken and threatened that in a state of cognitive confusion, they allow the abrogation or the, or the tearing down of the very freedoms and liberties they once so ardently championed. Something has happened. It is a crisis on this planet, and new voices speak up, and the entire playing field has been changed. Could it happen? Are you kidding? Will it happen? Listen, Daniel's already told us it's going to happen. Watch this. This is Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. There will be at the end of time such a time of distress, such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. There's something yet ahead. Jesus picks up on Daniel, and in the little apocalypse of Matthew chapter 24, notice the words, the prediction of Jesus, just before I return, watch, this, watch what's going to be on this planet. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those, in fact, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, the friends of God on earth, those days will be shortened. If they had allowed, if, if it had been allowed for the crisis to continue to mount, and the entire human race would be gone. 
but for the sake of his friends. Enough. Enough. And then what does Michael Barkham remind us? What does he remind us? Put it on the screen again, please, one more time. Michael Barkham, social scientist. Disaster produces the questioning, the anxiety, and the suggestibility that are required for belief system change. Only in its wake are people moved to abandon old values of the past. And what old values of the past will America abandon? What have we already read? Political power will enforce religious worship. You never heard of such a thing in the history of this nation. But there's a dusty old book that says, you watch, this will happen to the United States of America. Wow. Read it again, verse 11. And then I saw a second beast coming up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its, and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Sounds to me a whole lot like Mount Carmel, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, redo. Only you know what's different this time? The dragon who watched Mount Carmel, which was a spectacular revelation of supernatural power to turn the hearts of the people from the devil back to the creator God. The devil says, I'll take that same miracle and I'll reverse it. I will turn through the bringing down of whatever it is, fire from heaven. I will turn the world away from the creator God to me. I'll put it off. Mercy. And by the way, that's been, the, amb that's been the, amb the ambition of the dragon from the very beginning. The dragon who, of course, is the greatest antichrist of all. Verse 14, because of the signs. By the way, these signs apparently are so persuasive. Listen, listen, listen. This is a university community. They are so persuasive that atheist scientists says the whole world. Atheist scientists who will not be able to explain this and can only determine it must be the finger of the Almighty himself because it's the whole world. Verse 14, because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it... This country deceives the inhabitants of the earth. We have now a confederacy of two global superpowers who have confederated together to rule the planet. That's what's going on. It, this second beast power, deceives the inhabitants of the entire earth. It's global. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Verse 15, and the second beast, this country, was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, that global superpower out of Rome, so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be what? We're going to kill you. Do you understand that? Hey, folks, guess what? This is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all over again in spades. You remember that story, don't you? The three young Hebrew worthies. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I got an image right here. You see that, baby? I want you to bow down. You're going to bow down, and if you don't bow down, we will, it's over. Do you understand that? This is the, this is, this is the story replayed. The whole world will be commanded. You worship that. Will there be an Abednego? Will there be a Meshach? Will there be a Shadrach on this planet at that moment that will stand up and say, I don't care what this power declares. I refuse to bow down to that image. You may kill me if you wish. God, if he wants, can deliver me. But even if he doesn't, I will not bow down to you. Here I stand. So help me, God. Yeah, apparently, there will be a few who will resist. 
Hmm. Well, there are only two verses left. Here it comes. That mysterious mark of the beast. Verse 16, and it, the second global power, America, forces all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark. Apparently, this power, this global power, has control of the finances of the human race. And it can say, if I say you spend, you spend. If I say you have no access to spending, you have zero access. I have a little switch here. Everything's electronic. It's over. Apparently, the second beast has the wherewithal to economically throttle this planet. Man. Oh, man. Let's read verse 17 again. So that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the first beast, the Antichrist, or the number of its name. There you have it. The dreaded and mysterious mark of the beast. But in a freedom-loving church and state separating America, how can that be? Look at this. Let me quote Richard Evans in his book, The Coming of the Third Reich. On the screen, he asks only four questions. Four questions he asks. Here they are. How was it that an advanced and highly cultured nation such as Germany in the 1930s could give in to the brutal force of national socialism so quickly and so easily? Good question. Question number two, why was there such little serious resistance to the Nazi takeover? Question number three, how could a party of the radical right rise to power with dramatic suddenness? And now question number four, why did so many Germans fail to perceive the potentially disastrous consequences of ignoring the violent, racist, and murderous nature of the Nazi movement? I add three questions to these four. Question number five, how could a man like Adolf Hitler walk away with the churches of Germany in his hip pocket? How does that happen? Question number six, where was the Christian resistance to a ruler and party so antichrist in their governance? And question number seven, and when Hitler declared, let us blame the Sabbatarians for our ills, why did so preciously few religious leaders challenge his corrupted logic regarding the Jews? Instead, what do you have? You have the clergy of the day currying up to the Fuhrer's table. They want to sit at that table. Power is contagious. I worry today. I worry today. Could it happen in America? I'm deeply concerned for clergy seeking to sit at the table of power. I am concerned. Listen, I got an email from one of our viewers who said, I see you're going to talk about the religious right. Don't forget the irreligious left. So that's a good point. I agree. But the history of Germany, we just saw it. The history of Germany is a stunning reminder that even good-hearted Christian men and women and leaders can be duped into embracing an anti-Christ set of values. How serious is this mark of the beast business? Oh, mercy. You want to read how serious this is? Just cross the page. Go to Revelation chapter 14. This is how serious it is. There are three angels here in Revelation 14. They are uttering and issuing God's final, strategic, passionate appeal to the human race. Two angels have already sounded their warnings and their cries. Here comes angel number three now, verse 9, Revelation 14. And a third angel followed the two and said in a loud voice, there's that megaphone voice again, if anyone worships the beast and its image 
and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day nor night for those who worship the beast and its image or anyone who receives the mark of its name. Have mercy. That little apocalyptic classic, The Great Controversy, you know how it calls, you know how it describes this message right here. The most fearful threatening ever addressed to mortals in the history of the human race. You just read it. Man. Something is obviously hugely at stake for God to be so dire in his warning. Because you see, the apocalypse dramatically describes the contrast between the mark of the beast and the seal of God. And the critical ID factor, both are about worship. Let me show you. Let's go to the seal of God. We already know the mark of the beast. We just read the description. Just go back a few pages. This is Revelation 7. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, north, south, east, west. Something is, 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 is just busting out of the seams to destroy this planet, but these angels have been assigned to hold it back. Hold it back. Not, not, not yet. Not yet. Holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on the or on any tree. Verse 2, then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. There it is. And he called out in a loud voice, another megaphone voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Verse 3, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. What do we already know about the mark of the beast? Let's just review this. It'll help us with the seal of God. Now, the mark of the beast, where did it go? Do you remember where the mark of the beast went? Come on, help me out. It went, it went first where? Right hand. Tap your right hand right now. Tap your right hand. That's the hand. It'll go there. What is this, some, some embedded uh, QR code? No. Supermarket barcode? No. That's the stuff you read from the National Enquirer. We'll find out what it is. Oh, so it'll either go here or it'll go where? The seal of God, where does it go? It does not go here. You know why? Because the hand represents compliance. The hand represents the crowd just is dragging me along. Wherever the guys are going, I'm going. Wherever the girls are going, I'm going. Some people follow the crowd. They'll follow the crowd like lemmings over a cliff. There will be nobody going into the kingdom of God being dragged along. God does not have a crowd being dragged into heaven. God only has people who do this, who think, who think, who think. Great news for a university that's paid to think. They think critically, prayerfully, cautiously. They choose here. So you got two competing seals or marks, two of them. Wow. You choose. Whom, I'm, whom, whom shall I obey? You choose. Whom shall I worship? Come on, you choose. Because you see, the, sea, the, 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 the seal of God and the mark of the beast represent two sources of authority. Watch this. The mark of the beast symbolizes the authority of the Antichrist. That would be human authority. The seal of God represents the authority of the Creator. That would be divine authority. Plain and simple. In fact, my friend Yiji Moscala, who's the dean of the Theological Seminary here on campus, he wrote a piece in this month's Adventist Review. And it's spot on. I want, to, I want to put this on the screen for you. The three angels' message. He's dealing with all three of them as one message. The three angels' message is God's response to the demands of the satanic trinity. Good night. What is this? Well, let's see what he says. He says it's a dragon. Okay, we got that one. That's Satan. The sea and land beast. Okay, Rome, America. Oh, the satanic trinity. Go back, please, uh, to that satanic trinity. Yeah. So, so what's he saying here? 
the, the three angels' message is God's response to the demands of the satanic trinity. What are they demanding? Keep going now. They're demanding universal obedience. Guess what? People who hate obedience, it won't matter in that day. You have to obey. And both forces, the forces of Christ and the forces of the fallen dragon, Lucifer, both forces will demand obedience. There is no middle ground. Well, I don't want, I'm not going to obey either of them. No, I'm sorry. It's either one or the other. And they will demand it. Keep reading. But the three angels' message shows the Holy Trinity, now in, in, in a contradistinction, exposing these end time deceptions and fake news, helping people to make right choices and worship the Lord in truth. And in fact, get this, Yiji Moscala in this article describes how between Revelations 13, Revelation 13 and 14, these two chapters, between the two trinities, worship, the word worship occurs eight times, eight times. Let's put this sentence on the, on the screen so that we will never forget it. Worship is a huge deal in the end game for the human race. Worship, worship, worship. You cannot define that end game any other way but pointing out that it is the issue of worship at the very end of time. Either it will be the Creator and His authority or the Antichrist and His authority. Can you prove that, Dwight? Of course I can. I'll put it right here. Let's put the two verses on the screen here. These are the... These are the verses that talk about worship. The first angel's message, worship him, the creator, who made heaven and earth and the springs of waters. Worship is the big deal with the creator. Of course it is. And, and we just read it, Revelation 13, 15. And the second beast, America, was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, the Antichrist, in Rome, so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Worship, worship. It's the end game's last Appeal. Whom shall I worship? Whose authority takes precedence in my life, God's or man's? Christ my creator or the dragon and his antichrist? I have to choose. Wow. I, I, I must remind you that the Creator could hardly be clearer about His authority. Let's put it on the screen once again, the fourth commandment from the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. By the way, the Creator, and in the New Testament is clear that Jesus is the Creator uh, that appears in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The Creator, with His own finger, wrote these words in granite so that they could not be erased. All right, what did he write in the fourth commandment? Well, let's read it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Keep going. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He has put his divine imprimatur on that seventh day Sabbath from the beginning of human time, and he's never taken it off. He has hallowed it. He sealed it. <laughs> Oh, boy. Have you seen, ever seen one of these? Come on, come on. It's bugging me this whole time sitting in my pocket, but have you ever seen one of these? You've seen these little seals? You can buy these seals, and you can, you, can, you can emboss a piece of paper, a letter that you're signing, and when you put this seal on it, oh, boy, that's, that's official because that came with your seal on it. This is a seal. Everybody knows a seal. Now, now look it. If I were President of the United States, and you can be thankful that I'm not, if I were President of the United States, I would have a seal for myself. Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. And this, was, this is how my seal would read. True, this is really how my seal would read. Uh, let's put it on the screen. Dwight Seal. That's not an animal. <laughs> this is not SeaWorld. <laughs> you understand that, don't you? Yeah, this is a seal. All right, Dwight Seal. So my seal would have my name, Dwight Nelson. It would have my office, president. And by the way, that is a capital P president, all right? And it would have my jurisdiction, United States of America. Now, just lock this screen in your mind. And I want to ask you the question, is it too late to get on the ballot for this election? I'm just wondering. Look. <laughs> of course not. So that's what goes into a seal. When the, when, when the president takes his personal seal, so he's going to sign an executive order, but when he signs the executive order and then he seals it with the seal of the president of the United States, he has locked in his authority to what is now sealed. 
His authority is all over it. Of course it is. <laughs> does God have a seal? Oh, yes, he does. Well, what's in God's seal? His name, his office, and his jurisdiction. Come on, are you serious? Yes, we just read God's seal. Let's go back to the fourth commandment. Let's do it. Come on. Fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the seventh day of the week. For in six days the Lord, stop, stop, stop. That's his name, Yahweh. It's the only place where he's named here. Look at this is the this is the the lawgiver. He has the authority. So we see his name. The, for, in se, for in six days the Lord made. Oh, stop, stop, stop. Because made, he's a maker. That's his office. He's the creator. He's the maker. He made. Now keep reading. The heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. Oh, stop again. That's his jurisdiction. Ladies and gentlemen, just look at that screen. He has a seal with his name, his office, and his jurisdiction plainly shown. And it was carved in granite so that nobody could, nobody could stand, stand up and say, no, no, I, the seal should be in my name. I'm the one that decides. No, you are not. Every seventh day of the week brings the seal. Come on, read the last line, please. And what did God do? This, the one who seals the law, he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. The seventh day Sabbath is God's seal of authority as the creator of the universe. And when I worship him on his day, I am declaring to the universe and to everybody on earth, I have one source of authority, and that is my creator. I owe my allegiance to him forever and ever. Amen. That's what I say when I worship on his day. Now, in opposition to the seal of God, the mark of the beast is a counter-authority seal. And I want you to see it right here. The Roman Catholic Church. This is a direct quote. Sunday is our mark of authority. I didn't write this. They did. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. There are two seals. One's called a mark, the other a seal. One's the mark of the beast, the other is the seal of God. And it will come down to a very plain and simple choice. Put it on the screen here. You will choose either the seal of God in his seventh day Sabbath. There's not a third, there, there's nothing here. There's no third choice. Well, I'm going to take this one. You can't, you can't. You will choose the seal of God in his seventh day Sabbath or the mark of the beast in its substitute Sunday. That's the only choice. The only choice. And the majority of this planet, as we just read in Revelation 13, the majority will say, okay, I'll go along with it. I don't believe in it, but I'll go along with it. Or I believe in it. You can count me in. Will there be anybody to say, excuse me, excuse me, time out, time out, excuse me. Is there room for a second opinion? Yes, there will be, an, there will be, an, there will be a minority. It will be small. But the apocalypse is clear. God does not lose in the end. Watch this. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. We just read it in our scripture reading a moment ago. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. There will be a, there will be a minority, Sabbatarians, to the end. There will be. Oh, and there's one more verse, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, and the dragon, Satan, was enraged with a woman, the pure woman, God's true church. He was enraged with a woman, and he went to make war with the rest, the remnant of her seed or offspring who keep the commandments of God. I guess that includes the fourth commandment. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, the good news is God the Creator will have a people who are Sabbath-keeping, Creator-obeying, and Jesus-loving worshipers at the end of time. No matter how hot that furnace is stoked up to be, they will say, I cannot and I will not change my mind. I will stand for him. Do whatever you want. Huh. Question. 
Does anybody have the mark of the beast today? Answer, no. The sea beast has yet to collaborate with the earth beast in this global confederacy for the end game. The truth is there are tens of thousands of Christians today who worship Jesus on Sunday believing it's the Lord's day. They love him with all their hearts. Nobody has told them otherwise. Their pastors haven't corrected them because their pastors don't know. And so with sincerity and devotion to their Lord, they are living up to all the light that is shining on their pathway. Nevertheless, to observe the Seventh-day Sabbath still remains God's will for all Christians, whether the mark of the beast has been formed yet or not. It does not matter. So what should you do? I grew up in Japan, and I used to go to school every day on the trains of Japan, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. A few years ago, Karen and I went to visit Japan, my homeland. Had a wonderful time, got on a train, sat back. Man, this is going to be, oh, look at, the, look at the beautiful countryside, the city of Tokyo. Wow. And then I, I, I saw there was a, there was a, a map, a, a railway system map on the, on the side of the train car, and I'm looking at it and reading it, and I'm saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are going in the wrong direction. Now, these Japanese trains are something. Let me tell you about Japanese trains. Once you discover you've got the right ticket, but you're on the wrong train, you have two choices. You can stay on that train and keep going to where you never wanted to go. Or you can find a train that's going the way you wanted to go and you change trains. It's that simple. God is crying out to the human race to change trains and come to him as the creator of the human race. You've never, you may never have believed in a creator at all. You've grown up atheist. You have never even entertained the thought, even for you, the creator of the universe stretches out his nail-scarred hands, he says, come on, change trains. Change trains. Come to me. The Antichrist said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Come this way. But he can only take you where you never wanted to go. The Creator said, no, 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 no. Come this way, and I'll take you to where you've always wanted to go. Because when it comes to the Sabbath, it has always been all about Jesus. And that's the good news. And it's that simple. Come to me. Come to me, and I'll give you rest. A Sabbath rest like you have never had before. Come to me. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, Creator, Redeemer, Lord, and Savior. Wow. There are people right now whose minds are scrambling. They're saying, I never heard this before. What am I supposed to do now? Oh, Father, draw especially close to those, close to those whose minds are racing. Whisper in his ear, whisper in her heart that it's okay, that you'll make a way, you'll open a door and you will guide that life. We have nothing to fear for the future. Our Creator God still reigns. He's coming soon. And the choice is a simple one. Human authority, God's authority. Read every one of our hearts, Father. Let the record show that we choose the authority of God, our Creator, no matter what the cost will be in the name of Jesus who died for us, that all the people say, Amen. Amen. There's a connect card at the end of this uh, teaching. I'll put it on the screen for you. If you go to pmchurch.org slash connect, you'll see connect and you just click on there. Let's put it on the screen, please. My next step today is box number one. I want, to, I want the seal of God upon my life. I accept the seventh-day Sabbath as Jesus' gift to me. 
I hope you put a check mark there. Look at there's nobody going to see it but you. But just put that check mark there. Make a decision that you will begin to follow after today. Box number one. Okay, box number two. I would like to study more about the Sabbath. Please send me study material. If you put your email address on uh, that little digital connect card, we'll send electronically, we will send you some study material. Put a check mark there. We'd be happy to send it to you. Finally, box number three, I want to follow Jesus in baptism. Never been baptized before. You've been putting it off. Never thought about it before. All you have to do is just begin to think about his invitation. Put a check mark there. If you put your email address as well, we'll be in touch with you and say, hey, is there anything we can do to help? Ah, I'm glad Chuck is standing right here. There's this great old gospel hymn. And I need you to just sit down for a moment. We just got to catch our breath here. He's only going to sing two stanzas of it. I will follow thee, my Savior, wheresoever thy cross may lead. Chuck, please. <laughs> Before you go, let me take an extra moment to share with you an opportunity to get into the Bible in a fresh, new way. All across the world, more and more people are hearing the call to examine scriptures for themselves. If you felt drawn to learn more about God's Word, but you don't know where to start, or you're just looking for a more in-depth examination of Bible truths, then I have something right here that I believe you're going to enjoy. I want to send a series of guides to get you started. This one's entitled, Why Does God Allow Suffering? Each guide begins with a story, an introduction of the subject, then through a series of focus questions. You'll be learning portions of the Bible you may never have known before. And when you're through, you'll be able to share with others some of these inspiring Bible truths. So just call our toll-free number. It's on the screen, 877, the two words, His Will. Our friendly operators are standing by to send these study guides to you. Once again, that's 877, His Will. Call that number. And then again, join me next week right here at the same time, New Perceptions.